professors, great uh, supporter, good to see you. Uh, and I have some family in the audience and, and friends, um, my sister, her son, and my, my children's godfather, and Dom Candelaro came to, from the Italian culture, so I think you're, are you selling a book? We yeah, I, that's the wave it uh, when you get a Reconstructing chance. Reconstructing Italians in Chicago, a book that he and I just recently edited, um, which is, did it sell out of its first printing yet? Uh, no, but it paid for its first printing. Okay, it paid, that's even more important. <laughs> um, so it's good to be back, uh, back here, and, and back on the, on the kind of very land uh, that uh, created a reason uh, for having Italian-American studies. Uh, my goal was to try to, at some point in my life, convince Chicago that they needed to have Italian-American studies. Uh, New York uh, is where I've been for the last 14 years. I left very reluctantly uh, to build Italian-American studies programs there. It's been rather successful. My goal at some point would be to come back to Chicago, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, but in, in terms of what I'm working on now, I'm working on a book on Italian Americans and their relationship to humor uh, and the importance that humor has in creating uh, both an identity and sustaining an identity. Uh, if you know anything about Italian American culture, uh, we don't have the tradition that African Americans, Jewish Americans, uh, a lot of other uh, cultures have in terms of uh, uh, stand-up comedy and so on. And the talk today is designed to give you some insight as to why that's happening. In 1971, Michael Novak's The Rise of Un Unmeltable Ethnics woke Americans up to the realities that white ethnicities were not lost in a fog of assimilation. Novak pointed to the ambivalent attitude of progressive intellectuals towards the early 20th century immigrants as one example of how their idea of a melting pot was and would no doubt always remain a myth. Their ambivalence, said Novak, resulted from their privileging of individual accomplishments over those of family and community. This difference between the American privilege, privileging of self-reliance and the typical ethnic notion of tribal loyalty has created a tension that is key to helping us understand how American identities are shaped and reshaped over time. For Italian Americans, the fifth largest ethnic group in the United States, the years since the publication of Novak's book have been challenging in terms of developing and maintaining a sense of identity. What I want to do in my talk today is to survey the evolution of Italian American identity to show how we have had to continually revise our notions of what it is we refer to when we speak of things Italian American and to point to some ideas that might help us imagine what these identities might look like in the future. This talk looks at the role that humor plays in developing Italian-American identities and it examines the tradition of humor in Italian-American culture as a means of dealing with the traumas of becoming Americans. My thesis is that Italian-American identities have failed to move beyond the immigrant paradigm, even though immigration to the United States has dropped dramatically since the 1960s. This has led to a static and narrow view of just what today's Italian-American is as Italian-American organizations strive to preserve a traditional sense of what it means to be Italian, even as Italy has moved beyond that sense. I mean, the one thing the Italians always look at Italian-Americans and they say, you guys are completely different from us. We're not you. This forces youth to reach beyond the Italian-American community for clues in creating their, ident their identities, often depending on old stereotypes that resurface in sensational media portrayals such as those found in The Sopranos and Jersey Shore. Using the trope of Chucho, or the donkey, this talk follows the development of humor from Giordano Bruno through contemporary, uh, through contemporary writers to show how Italian Americans can learn to rely on alternative paradigms for developing ethnic-specific identities in this global age of multiculturalism. Paradigms that I argue will connect the past to the future in new and dynamic ways. Now, Italian immigrants to the United States were in the position of constantly negotiating their relationship between local cultures of origin and those of their land of immigration. The creation of Italian America can be read as a defensive strategy that helped protect the vulnerable Italian immigrants through the replanting process and enable them to develop this cultural sense of Italian identity from which they could venture into the big United States. As the Italian moved away from the Little East, 
the rewards and risks of Americanization became greater. Many immigrant men, for example, received U.S. citizenship by literally making the United States, building roads, skyscrapers, and by fighting in various wars. These colonie, or what they used to, what the Italian Americans used to call Little Italy's, became the sites of the earliest development of Italian American identities. But they were never meant to be permanent settlements. As critic Robert Viscusi tells us, Little Italy meant a captive market of eternal exiles who could neither enter the order of English America nor return to Italy. Little Italy was not only little by definition, but it was always getting smaller. In literary history, Little Italy has had two favorite themes, its own nostalgia and its own death. And if you look at Italian American literature, you find these, these two things of death and nostalgia. You know, looking back, you know, thinking that the days of the past were better, and death. Death is because these major themes that, that are being discussed but not the future, not life, etc. When Little Italy's die, what happens to Italian-American identities that were defined by geography and nurtured on unchanging notions of what it means to be Italian? Until recently, Italian-American culture has not depended on much, much on books for a sense of survival. As long as there were Little Italy's occupied by Americans of Italian descent, the histories and the stories never died. As long as a good memory was nearby, the past could always speak to the present. Oral traditions were kept alive through regular and ritual interactions with family and friends. This is no longer the case. As the years go by, the old neighborhoods change, families move away, and with them go the stories. As long as that oral system operated, the need for reading and writing is limited. When that system started breaking down, the future of Italian America began depending more and more on how its past was preserved in images and words. The deaths of Little Italy's get recorded in historical and uh, literary texts that become possible sites for the creation and maintenance of future identities. Now that the great majority of Americans of Italian descent no longer live in Little Italy's, it becomes the job of culture and not place to help maintain and transmit a cultural identity that we can call Italian American that often comes alive in metaphoric terms. For example, when I was growing up, just by virtue of the fact that I grew up in Melrose Park, I, I, I was Italian, even though my name Gardafe may have a vowel at the end, you know, it's a French name, and easily I could have hid the fact that I was Italian. Except when I was told people I was from Melrose Park immediately. So geography became the way of, of creating that identity. The struggle for identification with the United States was one of the immigrants' first battle, battles with the metaphor of America. Even at the entry to the United States, immigrants were immediately aware of their difference, their un-Americanness. Now, whether the metaphor came to one through song, letters, or conversation, it communicated a variety of messages. Much of the metaphor centered on ideas such as freedom, boundless opportunity, golden streets. But such prizes would be earned at a cost. Carmine Biagio Inace recorded his immigration experience in Italian in La Scoperta di America, una bio autobiografia, The Discovery of America, an autobiography. Iannacci immigrated with others from his village at the age of 17. He and his companions were advised to stick close and help each other out. But Iannacci soon realized, and this is a quote, when coming to America, everyone carries his own load. The sense of what is expected of the Italian is fundamentally challenged from this first encounter of life in the United States. Early Italian-American literature focuses on this dream-reality dichotomy and the coming to terms with the dispelling of the myth metaphor that lured the immigrant to America. First, it was a metaphor of separation. There are those things which are and are not American. This notion is reflected upon in much of the early Italian-American literature. Jerry Mangione's Montalegro, for example, opens with the exploration of this issue. And this is a, a, a quote from the book. When I grow up, I want to be American, Justina said. We looked at our sister. It was something none of us had ever said. Me too, Maria echoed. Ah, uh, you don't even know what an American is, Joe scoffed. I do so, Justina said. It was more than the rest of us knew. We're Americans right now, I said. Miss Zimmerman says if you're born here, you're an American. Ah, she's nuts, Joe said. He had no use for most teachers. We're Italians. If you don't believe me, ask Pop. But my father wasn't very helpful. Your children will be Americani, but you, my son, are half and half. Now stop asking me questions. You should know these things from going to school. What do you learn there anyway? 
This confusion over what is and what is not American carried over into the next generation and becomes more of a psychological problem for the children of immigrants than it had been for the parents. Much of this confusion was created and maintained by the media that reflected racist notions of Italian immigration to the United States. Assimilation used to be thought of as a melting down process, a process by which each immigrant group reached the same common denominator, the American citizen. In 1922, John Valentino wrote, immigrant children may yearn for freedom to live untrammeled American lives, but they can do so only by abandoning physically as well as intellectually their own households. So this was the advice that was pretty much going out. If you want to become an American, get out of your house and stop thinking the way the people in your family think. But by asking Ameri immigrant children to abandon their cultural foundation, or at least exchange it for one that was American, those who longed for a single American culture were denying the utility of cultural diversity. To, to Italian Americans, another metaphor of America communicated denial. It wasn't a problem of knowing what American was. Rather, the problem came in trying to avoid everything that common knowledge said America wasn't. To be American was to be what others were, and so Italian Americans soon modeled themselves after those that the media gave their attention to. Heroes were made out of historical figures like Columbus, Hollywood stars, assassinated presidents, war veterans, sports figures. Italian American literature is filled with this desire to be other, as the following selection from John Fonte's first novel demonstrates. His name was Arturo, but he hated it and wanted to be called John. His last name was Bandini, and he wanted to be called Jones. His mother and father were Italians, but he wanted to be an American. His father was a bricklayer, but he wanted to be a pitcher for the Chicago Cubs. In order to be American, to be other, the children of immigrants needed to defy their parents and grandparents and anyone else or anything else that reminded them of their non-American ancestry. They needed to turn their backs on what had been their past, to melt the mold of their heritage and hope it was ice, melt and evaporate without a trace. Leonardo Covello, an Italian-American educator responsible for educational reforms in New York that still take place today, and for including the teaching of Italian in New York schools, relates his conception of this dilemma. He writes, during this period, and he's talking about the 1900s, the Italian language was completely ignored. In fact, throughout my whole elementary school career, I do not recall one mention of Italy or the Italian language or what famous Italians had done in the world with the possible exception of Columbus, who was popular in America. We soon got the idea that Italian meant something inferior and was a barrier that was erected between children of Italian origin and their parents. This was the accepted process of becoming Americans, by learning how to be ashamed of our parents. And this notion of shame creeps in, and, 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 and we'll see later on in my talk. In order for Italian immigrants to demonstrate total loyalty to their new American identities, they would have to learn to disassociate themselves from their native country and quite often become anti-Italian in their actions and attitudes. Richard Gambino in a 1983 article wrote, If any of the traditional Italian values are to survive, they can no longer rely solely on the custom of family education. Italian Americans must become conscious of their traditional values through formal education. Only recently have Italian Americans entered schools in numbers approaching the national average. This in spite of the fact that for two decades Italian Americans have earned incomes well above the national average. But attending American schools was no guarantee that Italian Americans would become conscious of what might be their traditional values, unless those values had been integrated into American culture and were explored in what was studied in the mandatory education required of all U.S. citizens under the age of 16. But long before Italian Americans could study their own culture in schools, they had been the objects of major academic investigations. So while there's nothing going on in the schools, academics are beginning to do this research. The study of Italians in the U.S. has long been a function of social scientists, primarily anthropologists, historians, and sociologists. Robert Forrester's The Italian Immigration of Our Times, first published in 1919 by Harvard University, is one of the first major English language studies of why people had left Italy in large numbers between 1876 and 1909. And the words Italian-American never appear in the study of over 500 pages. Turn-of-the-century magazines are filled with articles decrying the coming of the Italians or arguing for their acceptance as Americans. 
These range from accounts of crime and work accidents in articles such as What Shall We Do With the Dago, which was in Popular Science Monthly. Uh, actually, the article appeared December of 1890 and February of 1891. Another one is Italians Can Be Americanized, which was in the North American Review in 1896. In many of these early studies, the authors used depictions and descriptions of Italian eating habits to demonstrate how strange these people were. As in this April 1897 um, Arena Magazine article by Frederick O. Bushy, or Bushy of South End uh, House, a Boston settlement house in the matter of, of Jane Addams, he writes, The dinner of the ordinary Italian is largely made up of macaroni, French or Italian bread, and usually some meat or potato. That form of flour preparation known as spaghetti is the most frequently used. This is boiled whole and served as a first course. The Italian experiences no difficulty in eating this slippery food, for he merely sucks it into his mouth from his fork in a very unconventional, if not unelegant, manner. If the tone of this seemingly innocuous article is not offensive enough, out of context, then a brief look at the conclusion will show you that Bouchy's purpose is to argue for the relocation of Italians from the city to rural areas into what he calls agricultural com uh, colonies composed of Italian peasants. So his goal was to get the Italians out of the city, move them out into the country. It's no wonder that the authors of these early studies and accounts did not foresee the Americanization of the Italian, and thus the words Italian-American would not or could not be used, for you were either Italian or you were American. Now I want to show you briefly uh, these, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I had the quotes up there, but you didn't need to okay. go. And, okay. These are some of the earliest cartoons that appeared in, this was in Life Magazine, 19 left, um, I don't know if you can read it that far back. Half a kilo of spaghetti and a hanky around his neck, stiletto and fustian pants, put garlic in your mouth and animal-like mouthfuls, and a talent to shine boots. All right. You can go to the next one. He sharpens the stiletto used by New Orleans assassins. Now, you need to know that in 1891, the largest recorded lynching uh, in the United States happened with uh, 12, 11, what was it, 12, 14 Italians. 11, 11 Italians were lynched um, after the police chief had been murdered. Uh, in New Orleans, and so this is where the, the idea of the assassin in, in New Orleans comes in. But what this guy is, he's a knife sharpener, and the, the, and the idea is that he's sharpening knives for, uh, for gangsters or assassins, when really, it was like, you know, up until, I, I don't know how long ago, there was uh, Italian, uh, there was a guy who used to go by in a, in a little... Uh, in the um, 60th city, right? Yeah. I think he, a little bicycle type thing, he would yeah. wheel it and, and sharpen it. It was a respectable way of earning a living, uh, but they, in this cartoon, it's turned into a connection to the gangster. Next. Here's one. It says, a mafia-associated cobbler in an Italian neighborhood. Well, first of all, he's not a cobbler. He's not doing shoes. He's doing straws. He's a palista. And uh, the idea is that he's making shoes for, for the mafia. I mean, what, what, is, what is the mafia in this guy working have to do. And you're going to see every time an Italian is perceived as a worker, he's perceived as a gangster. Uh, new country, old uh, old uh, jobs, I guess you could say the way of looking at it. Begging. Italians were beggars. All right. The, uh, okay, we'll just pause it right there. Italian-Americans have unknowingly been reinventing their ethnicity whenever they have learned something new about themselves. And in due time, the immigrant paradigm would stop working as a way of conceptualizing Italian-American identity. This reinvention, as Michael M. J. Fisher tells us, is accomplished through what he calls a narrative's interreferences between two or more cultural traditions, which creates reservoir for renewing humane values. So Fisher looks at this tension between Italian and American is a possibility for renewing humane values. He says, by identifying and reading these interreferences, we will be able to see that, he concludes, ethnic memory is or ought to be future, not past-oriented. And this is key, because most of the way Italian-Americans look at, come on in, most of the way Italian-Americans look at identity is past-oriented. In fact, the only thing Italian-Americans have in common is a past, pretty much. 
This, I say, is an idea that needs to be developed as we begin looking for ways to present Italian-American culture in classroom at all, classrooms at all levels and to preserve it in museums and other cultural institutions. As I am suggesting today and what my longer investigation demonstrates is that Italian-American identity is fluid and constantly shifting shapes, changing often, more often than most scholars will acknowledge. How else could we account for a significant increase reported by the 2000 census of the number of those who identify themselves as Italian American or Italian when there has not been a similar increase in immigration from Italy since the 1990 census. So if Italian Americans are moving away from the experience of immigration, how can and will people continue to identify themselves as Italian American? Until we have studies that explore beyond the possibilities of the European American identity, noted in the recent works of Richard Alba and the ethnic options of Mary Waters' studies, we do well to examine how Italian American identities are being reshaped through its culture's artists, who are often avant-garde, um, who often are the avant-garde that challenge stated notions of identity. Italian Americans have often preserved traditions more rigidly than their Italian counterparts, who allow contemporary life to influence rituals and practices. So when Italians look at Italian Americans, they don't see any reflection. And when Italian Americans look at Italy, they don't see Italian, they don't see the Italian. And they, be, they believe very strongly that we have maintained the real Italy, and Italy has gone off in a completely wrong direction. These differences have been the focus of a number of important new studies in terms of politics. Stefano Luconi, for example, has written a book on, on changing politics. Food preparation and presentation. Uh, a couple of uh, graduate students of mine, Francesca Muccini and, and uh, Francesca Mirti, uh, have written books about the relationship between traditional Italian food, <coughs> Italian-American food, and then the, the kind of com commercial Italian food you find in Olive Garden. Uh, Celebration of Material Culture and Festivals by Joseph Shora. Language use. Herman Holler did a study, Tra Napoli in New York, Le, Ma Le Macchietti Italo Americani di Eduardo Migliaccio, and he looks at how language has changed. And also regional identity. Chiara Mazzucchelli recently did a, a dissertation on Sicilian American, even looking at it a little bit more differently. Italian American identity was formed both from history and story. Until recently, there's been a film fiction emphasis in Italian-American culture, as opposed to a non-fictional emphasis via documentary studies. There's not very many big documentary films on Italian culture. The impact of the fiction has been greater than its non-fiction. When we begin to examine this, and what it, can, what it is that can be called Italian-American culture, we see that Italianità, or Italianness, has become a closet with all the claustrophobia that small spaces encourage. For example, rarely can you see a horizon in an Italian-American film or novel. There's, there's no sense of, primarily because they're more urban-oriented, but even, even in the suburbans, there's no sense of looking out over a horizon. Even the paintings by Italian-Americans tend toward the urban, the crowded, the close-up, as opposed to possible meditations on the open spaces of the country. The unknown and the natural. Instead, there is this claustrophobic concentration on the known and the familiar, as though reality and history was a mantra that would make everything safe if it was only simply repeated over and over again. This is the way we are. This is the way we were. This is the way we are. This is why it's so important for Italian Americans to understand their own histories as they move beyond the experiences of immigration. If this does not occur, the problem is that Italian Americans will become fixed on how others identify them, which is the way they are today. Gangsters, buffoons, obsessed with producing and consuming food, and any number of other ways society packages and consumes commodities inspired by Italian culture. While much of this representation and commodification is simply so much spice to create alternatives to bland Anglo-Saxon fare, it is also a way to project opposites to a people obsessed with separating good, evil, light, dark, black, white. Without knowledge of ethno history, without knowledge of ethno stories, individual ethnic groups are limited to reacting to what others produce and kept from creating their own expressions. Italian Americans are being defined by others, not by themselves. One key to helping us understand this is examining how what happened when the Italian language stopped being spoken and how communication flows stop between parent and child, between one generation and the next. We need studies of how and why dialects and language were lost, and how these losses created general gaps 
and memory lapses. Now, within the Italian-American culture, identities must be understood in terms of race. Coming to terms with whiteness and the privileges awarded those who adopt and maintain racist thinking, also of gender, understanding contemporary historical power relationships between men and women. We also need to look at lifestyle, coming to terms with various sexualities. We need to look at religion, how different religions came to be practiced in the United States. And of class, especially class, I would argue, understanding the economic system and their place in it. We must all understand how these elements condition behavior and identity. These are new subjects in the arts and humanistic and social scientific studies done by and about Italian Americans. Key works here include those by literary critics Mary Jo Bona's By the Breath of Their Mouths, Robert Viscusi's Buried Caesars, and historian Jennifer Guglielmo and sociologist San, Sal Salerno's Are Italians White. And we can find this also in some of the uh, memoirs of people like Teresa Maggio, Paolo, Paolo, Paolo Paolicelli, and Mark Rotella. These and many other works have become the sites for creation of new identities that will challenge traditional notions of what it means to be Italian and American. And the transmission of this information will happen less inside the geographical spaces of Little Italy. You're not going to find these books in Italian Americans' uh, homes, but you will find them in the libraries. You may find some in, in bookstores. Now, what does this all have to do with humor? That's my way of setting you up for what I think humor has to, to add to this uh, equation, or maybe not an equation. Italian immigrants to the United States had much to dream about as they made their way to the U.S., but they also had much to fear. Often those fears became the basis for humor that appeared in the macchetti of actors, or, or, or sketches, of actors like Eduardo Migliaccio, who was known as, uh, on the stage as Farfariello, the butterfly. The loss of Italian language entertainment due to the loss of Italian language as a major means of communication among generations, led, has led to the loss of a tradition of humor that once was a major tool in dealing with fears and coming to terms with issues of personal and public identities. Without the vehicle of humor, immigrant fears would grow into terrors that would be repressed and suppressed. Take a look at the perils involved with immigrant travel and entry experiences crystallized in such films as Nuovo Mondo, The Golden Door. The 1891 mass lynchings in New Orleans, New Orleans, the terror of the experiences of Sacco and Vanzetti, and that of alien, alien enemy internment during World War II, and then the post-war rise of the Mafia. And you will see the obstacles that kept Italian Americans from publicly identifying as Italian Americans, which is a crucial step in the tradition of humor. You need to come out and say, Yes, I'm, this is I'm Italian American, and this is what's silly about us, this is what's great about us, and we have not done the silliness. Roberto Saviano, author of Gomorra, a powerful story of the Camorra in Naples, is right when he says that silence is not the way to confront the fear of organized crime, nor is protesting dramatic portrayals of mafiosi. Italian Americans have spent more time and money fighting fictional mafia than they have been in fighting real mafia in their midst. There are two fears that have guided this approach. One is the actual fear of these gangsters, which is what keeps them alive and well. The other is the fear of being Italian-American that keeps ignorance alive. Not knowing their own past has led Italian-Americans to combat fictional representations the way Don Quixote went after windmills. Only through knowledge of self and of Italian-American cultural history can Italian-Americans successfully develop a culture that both defeats and transcends the mafia stigma that has stained their public image. Because Italian Americans have been cut off from knowledge of their own histories through the loss of language, the subsequent non-transference of personal histories and stories due to the loss of that primary language of those experiences has created a safe sense of Italian American identity rooted in the past and protected by the inability to change so that the identity could continue into later generations. The failure to deal with historical problems has led Italian Americans into the trap of being identified with fictional representations that have gone on to create, to cause real social problems. This failure to produce a multiplicity of identities, in other words, many different ways of being Italian American, which associated, would affect the way Italian Americans relate to humor and irony. Humor requires taking a step back from what is happening 
in order to reflect upon, express, and comment on what that reflection produced. This critical distance is rarely achieved in Italian-American culture. To look at life in new ways requires the creation of different perspectives that would make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. Laughter requires a confrontation of fear. The experience of its tension and the dissipation of that tension through a defiance of that fear that could be expressed through the laugh itself. Too often, laughing at Italian-American culture or making fun of one's own people requires a display of bruta figura, which is a big no-no for Italian-Americans, or ugly figure. Even, even when, and I would say especially when, it is positioned ironically. German political philosopher Karl Marx told us that history repeats itself first as tragedy, second as farce. For Italian-Americans, the farce has yet to appear on any effective level. There have been no Italian-American farces. I mean, the closest you might be able to get is to argue that there's a little bit of farce in The Sopranos. Um, but you really would have to work at that. The figura centrism found in Italian-American culture, or a culture that's built on the way people present themselves, this stress on how one appears to others in public was a survival tactic in a country that was continually occupied by foreign powers. And the focus on figura enabled Italians to maintain a distance from those outsiders, protecting self and family from physical and often psychological harm. For Italian Americans, this figura for survival mentality became an obstacle to using humor seriously as figura centrism resists the cognitive dissonance necessary to understand and enjoy incongruity, one of the key elements of humor. It also lessened the tolerance of ambiguity. This is why Italian-American culture tends to be preserved and presented as static, unchanging form of identity more aligned with tragedy than with comedy. Critic Robert Viscusi tells us, it was clear to the discourse, if not to its explicators, that no other role was open to Italians in American imagination except that of divinities. The Puritans had preempted the role of moralists, what, what uh, R.W.B. Lewis calls the American Adam, and blacks the place of victim. So he says that, and, and you find this in, in Italian-American literature, Christ in concrete, like lesser gods. There's a number of these, these metaphors of immigrants as kind of Christ figures. A tragic-centered culture focuses on emotional versus thought-based behavior. It privileges the ideal over the real, the serious versus the playful, and work versus leisure. And you'll find these as all the most common themes in Italian-American literature. It also privileges a hierarchical and patriarchal versus a democratic kind of so social structure. The results of the tragic-based culture is that tradition is upheld and resistant to change, something that leads to isolation as opposed to integration. Italian-Americans tend to conceptualize the past as a tragedy when it comes to immigrant ancestors, who in their personal histories and stories take on the roles of superheroes who struggle against overwhelming social forces in order to fashion their lives. I remember asking my grandmother, tell me about Italy. She goes, oh, that was miseria. You don't want to talk about it. So she became this kind of saint of the, with the ability to endure miseria, whatever miseria was. For those early Italian-American writers, then, work as a concrete entity replaces an abstract notion of God as presented in the Christian religion. Workers, in giving their lives for their jobs, become, as the title of Mari Tomasi's uh, novel says, like lesser gods. The message of Tomasi's novel is that a worker's immortality can be achieved only through one's work. Just as work can give one life and provide for the lives of one's family, it can also take life away. And so work is the greater God. Similar ideas about work and its role in life and death come to us in contemporary writings of the novelist Jay Perini, his novel called The Patch Boys, and Denise Giardina's novel Storming Heaven, which are both about minors. Few, if any, of this literature, and even later work in film, use comedy to relieve the tensions created by the tragedy of immigrant life. There is no release of this tension, and so the tragedy is something that's bared so that future grandmothers run around saying, it was miseria. I have this miseria. I 
And so the result of this tragedy-based culture is that Italian Americans keep the memory of the immigrant struggle alive out of survival guilt. They did this so that I could survive. I have to uphold them, and they they become saints, which 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 have no no uh, no no faults. It also requires a religious sense of culture that relieves or relives. We live those great acts of sacrifice that led to later successes through rituals that remind new generations of the experiences that came before them. Without comic intervention, without comic relief, Italian American culture will remain trapped in a museum that will become increasingly irrelevant to new generations of Americans who continue to identify themselves as Italian American. Now there has been very little critical analysis done on the role that humor plays in Italian American culture. Emilice Alejandre has presented some of its history and translated some sketches. Uh, um, Sal Primeggia, Joe Veracalli, they've done some similar descriptive work and commentary on such figures as Eduardo Migliaccio, Nicola uh, Paone, Pat Cooper, Floyd Vivino, and others. There's an article on Jerry Mangione's humor by John Lowe in a recent address uh, that, that Lowe gave at a conference. But beyond these articles, there has been virtually no serious study of Italian-American humor. And so it's my goal in this work to advance that discussion. Primeggia and Vericali have created some categories that characterize Italian-American humor. And here's what they say. What makes comedy Southern Italian, then, is that in both subtle and overt ways, the comedy is influenced by and manifests the orientations of cynicism, traditionalism, marginality, personalism, familialism, and work be just about anybody's comedy. <laughs> and while I can see that where they're coming from, if we try to apply these categories to most American comedians of Italian descent, we would find that very few of them actually would be considered Italian-American. These categories work well for uh, Farfariello's older stage comedy because the humor of Farfariello is not family-based. It's culture-based. And the same goes for the comedy of Uncle Floyd Vivino, who you probably don't know. Uncle Floyd is this kind of comic character who survived in New Jersey. Uh, you can probably find him on the internet. But what, have I, what I've observed in the past 10 years is that I'm beginning to pay attention to comedy produced by Italian Americans is that most of what has and can be called Italian American humor is family based. And as such, is limited effectiveness in portraying a more generalized notion of Italian American culture. Now in 2009, I attended two live comedy events. Um, one was the Italian Chicks, and you can find them on the internet. Uh, a show composed of three Italian American women comedians. None of them strayed far from their family in terms of their humor. The same can be said for a second show done by more mainstream comedians, which was held at Caroline's, one of the big comedy clubs in New York. For years I have been monitoring the comedy offerings on cable television, and I can say that I've never seen an Italian-American comedian whose repertoire deals with cultural issues similar to those found in the comedy of other ethnic uh, American comedians. And here I'm thinking of uh, the way that um, both Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor and um, Chris Rock deal with uh, African-American culture, the history. Uh, the way that uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, and uh, Larry David deal with Jewish culture. Only, only Larry David could make, use the Holocaust in a, in a humorous way. I don't know if you've ever seen that episode where they have the survivors. Um, there's a dinner and he says the survivor is coming. And so he thinks it's a survivor of the Holocaust. And indeed there is a survivor of the Holocaust there. But there's also a survivor from Survivor Show. Mm -hmm. And they get in an argument saying, you know, the guy in Survivor Show says, I had it rougher than you did. You know, I had to live on an island, and I had to have, uh, eat the worms, and, and he says, worms? What worms? And in, in, the, in the prison camps, we didn't. So there's this incredible, if, if any, anybody but a Jewish American comedian would have, would have done that, there would have been all kinds of uproars in America. Um, it won't be until we get to the third generation of Italian Americans that humor begins to come from culture and not only family. Here I'm thinking of the fiction of George Guida, the poetry of Robert Viscusi, and the blogs of a guy named Joey Ski, which you find on iItaly, but you don't know these people because it's very limited. Still, we have a long way to go. We have very little comedy in our literature, and not a single parody, not a single parody, which is very important. Why do we take our culture so seriously, make it sacred, preserve it in the sanctuary of memory? What does this lack of cultural-based humor say about Italian-American culture? 
These are a few of the questions I hope to answer as I follow the path of the chucho through Italian American culture. Now what I've done is I've taken for my talk today just one example of where we find humor in Italian American culture. Um, I have about six or seven different uh, uh, chapters that are going to be in this book. Um, but this one is, is called The Signifying Donkey or The Signifying Chucho. I don't know if you know in Italian American culture we call someone a chooch. It just means he's, he's kind of a jerk. He's kind of an idiot. He's kind of a hardworking, you know, kind of not necessarily uh, a bad guy. But um, in earlier work, I have identified what I call an irony deficiency in Italian American culture that most often occurs in the generation of children of immigrants. This talk begins to examine the humor of that generation of that generation to help us understand why Italian Americans have not developed their traditions of humor that are observable in other American ethnic groups. Irony deficiency comes from ignorance, fear, or, and or the inability to detach oneself from what it is that can be ironized. Irony deficiently, deficiency leads to the disease of literalism, evidenced by the inability to figure out or outfigure attempts to be humorous. A recent site for observing this disease is in many of the responses of individuals and organizations to such programs as The Sopranos. More unified acts by Italian Americans have been launched against fictional portrayals of the Mafia than were ever mounted against the real mafiosi in the United States. The complete opposite is true in Italy where people have risked and lost their lives in pursuit of the reality of being anti-mafiosi. So what is it about irony deficiency that leads to such behavior? Now I must be clear that I am not saying that children of Italian immigrants lack irony altogether. Certainly there is a great deal of irony in the writings of the likes of Jerry Mangione, Pietro Di Donato, John Fonte, and Rita Chedesi. But what I'm interested in is where in their writings is this irony located? Where it isn't? Why is there a, why is why there is a lack of it in certain situations? And so one of the sites who observes this is, is the chucho, or the donkey, where you see a figure of a donkey. Now, we, we, we use the donkey in the United States, oh, he made an ass of himself, and so on. Nuccio Ordine's examination of the ass, or the donkey, in Giordano Bruno's writings presents the notion of a positive and negative assininity. So there's positive aspects of being an ass, and negative aspects. He possesses this concept as a, he poses this concept as a series of coincidencia oppositorum, wisdom and stupidity, hard work and idleness, tolerance and intolerance, humility and pride, movement and stasis. Ordine points out that Bruno, quote, raised satirical and burlesque literature from a subordinate position, placing the serious and comic on the same level of dignity since both spheres express the veritas, or the truth, that dominates the universe. Now, I should step in and say, Giordano Bruno um, was a uh, Dominican priest who was observed, uh, uh, who was um, burnt at the stake. If you go to Rome, you go to the Campo di Fiori, Campo Fiori, and uh, you'll see his statue. And his statue is in the corner of, of, of the piazza in a strange place for a statue. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is true, but this is what I was told, that he, he's, he's shaped with his ass or his rear end towards the Vatican. Uh, and he was positioned that way purposely because he was burned at the stake as a heretic. Why? Well, he also believed that the uh, earth moved around the sun, which was something you weren't supposed to be, be telling. But I would argue that he taught the world how to laugh at the Catholic Church. He raised the sacred up with the secular. I mean, he raised the secular up with the sacred. And so, for that, for his attempt to make the world laugh at the church, he was burned at the stake. So that's why I think it's important to look at, at his early work. The nullification of vertical relationships is a testimony of a single horizontal space that goes beyond all false hi hierarchies to express the multiform representation of all things and the multiform fruits of all mental ingenuity. So he said, we're equal. The ass is just as good as the Pope. You know, so to call a Pope, basically he called the Pope an ass, um, which is not something you could live for. It could be said that Bruno burned at the stake as a heretic punished for laughing in authority. Now, Mikhail Bakhtin advances this idea, reminds us that the figure of the donkey has been known for centuries to symbolize the common folk 
and their position at the bottom of social hierarchy. The ass is one of the most ancient and lasting symbols of the material body lower strata, which at the same time degrades and regenerates. These coincidencia oppositori, or functions of the figurative chucho, is what I'm exploring. Now, the majority of Italians who immigrated to the United States between 1880 and 1920 came from a peasant culture based on oral rather than literate traditions. Books were not among the possessions carried along to move to America. In Italy, liter literacy was used as a tool by those in power to exercise and protect their power over others. The Italian institutions of church and state controlled access to this power by controlling access to literacy. It is no wonder then that the majority of Italians who immigrated to America were illiterate people who had no power to control their lives in Italy. In essence, they were considered as subhumans by those who held power over them. I'm going to need uh, to go to this poem real quick. There are many references to the plight of the Italian peasant being that, the same as the, um, the donkey. The typical beast of burden, all right, you can keep going ahead. More. Another one, another one. These are just some, some more examples. I, I think, okay, right there. In this poem, here translated from Sicilian uh, by, uh, into English by Justin Vitiello, Ignazio Butita uses the donkey as a metaphor for the peasant. So he says, the wretch drags the chain and the dumb donkey bears it, harnessed from dusk till dawn to the mill back and forth. So this is a serious, tragic poem about the donkey, which is really about the peasant. And if you look at it, such is the lot of the wretch, under the whip and rein, his neck under the yoke, groomed with a curry comb, trampled by the possession of kings, nobles, and prelates, drawing blood from the eyes, poor from... This is the, uh, the wretch's lot. This is the lot of, of the donkey. This is precisely the way of life that many of those who immigrated to the United States were hoping to change. While immigration would become the first step in gaining greater control over one's life, the acquisition of literacy in America would become a way of maintaining and increasing that control. For the immigrant, acquiring the ability to signify this experience or to talk about this experience would become the key to shifting from the powerlessness of an oral culture ruled by destiny to a written culture in which one could exercise greater control over one's life. We can observe this process through a number of chooch sightings. Um, we can go to the next one. The idea of powerlessness comes through again in a traditional Sicilian song that became a hit in the Italian-American immigrant community when Nicola Paione produced and sang it on his Aetna label. And this, this is, uh, he says, I bought a little donkey. This is like one of the most famous songs. It's, it's, it's a song uh, sung by uh, Vito Corleone when he's a young kid in, in uh, Ellis Island in that room when he's sitting there. I bought a little donkey. I bought it for $30. I, I sent it to get hay and it broke all its teeth. My little donkey died and tonight I cannot move from here. The donkey represents both a sense of fatalism but also a streak of stubbornness that many immigrants embody. But this song was intended to be heard by fellow Southern Italians. It, in it, the sheku, or, the, or the, um, the donkey, represents an endearing and sad presence of the Italian immigrant. This is a song that a young Vito Corleone sings to himself as he is placed in Ellis Island quarantine. The donkey returns in the film Godfather 3, when the son of a hitman does the donkey bray to, interview, uh, to entertain Don Alto Belli, and later performs it as a diversion while his father attempts to assassinate Michael Corleone. In 1960, the sighting of the donkey includes Dominic the Christmas Donkey, you probably heard this oh, yeah. song, written by Ray Allen and Sam Salzberg. Okay, notice they're not Italian. <laughs> uh, but it was famous um, through the singing of Lumanti. While there's a certain sense of joy connected to the song, Dominic represents the hard worker.